ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to the first webinar of 2023 uh, from the Multiple Sclerosis Academy. Uh, my name is David, I'm a consultant neurologist and I'm delighted today to be joined by Sinead Jordan, who's an advanced nurse practitioner at St. Vincent's Healthcare Group, and Sheridan Daly, who is a highly specialist speech and language therapist at Surrey Downs Health. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this webinar has been supported by, spon uh, by Sandoz, uh, but that's all they've done. They haven't had any control over the educational content of this activity. Uh, so this is what Sinead Sheridan and I hope to take you through. So over the next hour, we will be discussing the unspoken, which is speech and communication difficulties in multiple sclerosis. We hope that we're able to give you some insights into the real impact of changes in speech and language to the person with multiple sclerosis, to the way in which we deliver our services for people with multiple sclerosis and the NHS at large. Um, but I think it's fair to say that uh, Sinead Sharon and I don't really have all the answers. And we know from your pre-screen that there is a huge volume of uh, people with very uh, skills in speech and language therapy on the call. So ladies and gentlemen, please be really interactive as we go along, ask questions and also provide your own insights. And there's a couple of occasions where we're going to pause to try and come to a consensus, because if there's one thing that I hope you get from the end of the, from the end of this webinar is that there is no clear consensus. And this is an opportunity for us as a community to come together and try and do the best for our patients. Um, so hopefully we will be able to take you through some of these objectives today. We're going to understand the impact of speech and communication difficulties to people with multiple sclerosis. We'll understand some of the current evidence for management and speech and language difficulties. Uh, it's a little spoiler, there isn't as much as we'd like, but the flip side to that is that there are areas for potential research in the future uh, and places where it's going to be all the more important that we establish multi-agency uh, guidance and best practice. Um, we'll take us through some of the practical things that um, Sinead and Sheridan have been doing to help people with multiple sclerosis, both at early stages when they're starting to get difficulties with their speech, for example, in the work environment, but also how they can support people with more advanced communication difficulties uh, and taking some of the learnings from other neurodegenerative conditions to help us manage people with multiple sclerosis. Speech isn't one thing, it's a multiple crossover of symptoms, uh, and Sinead and Sheridan will take us through how they unpick some of those complexities uh, and how else they involve and how they mitigate the impact of family and carers. Um, and we've got an hour. <laughs> uh, so these are our disclosures. Um, one of the things that we've noticed in preparing this webinar is, because it's generally so easy for us to speak, we sometimes forget what an extraordinary and difficult skill it is. Uh, it's inherent to almost all of the things that enhance our human experience, making friends, being able to collaborate, being able to work together, telling each other stories. Uh, in this picture here, you might just see two guys at the bar being silly, telling each other silly jokes. Um, uh, you can see that actually on a molecular basis, what is happening uh, when these two guys sit together and tell jokes is rather extraordinary. Um, there's a massive integration of auditory, somatosensory, motor information uh, across vast areas of the brain, the temporal parietal, frontal lobe, cerebellum and basal ganglia. Uh, and this is a dynamic process. The brain is constantly monitoring and modulating outputs. So studies on strokes just show how much of the cortex is involved with uh, the processing of speech. Uh, so this is all the places where you can have a stroke and it has significant impacts upon your speech and vast areas of the cortex are involved. Uh, these are supported by a, um, a massive intricate wiring um, in these massive networks that span vast areas of the brain. Um, and these help with speech production, perception, semantic memory, your understanding of concepts and orthography, your understanding of the rules of grammar and syntax. Um, the vast areas of the brain are involved with speech production. And actually, when you put these things together, uh, almost half the brain has some impact upon the understanding or processing of speech. Um, so uh, 
when we get a condition like multiple sclerosis, which can randomly affect uh, both cortical gray matter and white matter areas, it would be reasonable to expect that it may have some very significant impacts upon speech. Uh, and this does seem to be the case. Uh, so some studies have shown that uh, almost half of people at some point may have some speech difficulties uh, that are able to be identified by another person. Uh, but I would caveat this research. This is the largest study that I can find, but it's only about um, 120 people in the two studies. Both studies were done by the same person, and they were from a flyer at Buffalo Hospital. Uh, and actually, we don't really have any other insights into just how prevalent speech problems are in people with multiple sclerosis. Uh, moreover, speech is complicated. When you're relaxed, it can be relatively easy, but speech difficulties are exacerbated by cognitive demands. Um, what is clear is that uh, problems with speech are associated with other adverse effects of multiple sclerosis, uh, including reduction in social support and unemployment, which seems intuitive given how important uh, being able to speak uh, nicely is to both of those. Um, uh, and here, if you mind just clicking through these, we, we've got vast uh, amounts of guidance as to how to manage other symptoms in multiple sclerosis. So uh, the NICE guidelines tell us how to manage all number of symptoms, fatigue, spasticity, oscillopsia, emotional ability, pain. Um, but actually, there's only two mentions of speech in the whole 6,000 words of the NICE guidance. Uh, and no consensus guidelines that I could come to for about about how to manage speech problems in multiple sclerosis. Uh, and that's where I hope this webinar will be helpful in uh, trying to get all our experience together in some practical things that we can do to support our patients. Um, so no further ado, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Sinead, who is an advanced nurse practitioner for multiple sclerosis. Sinead's gonna take us through a case of multiple sclerosis with speech problems who she supported. Uh, Sinead, you're very welcome. Hi everyone, thank you David. Um, as David mentioned, my name is uh, Sinead Jordan. I work um, as an advanced nurse practitioner in Dublin um, with, uh, with people with multiple sclerosis. Um, I mean, to start off, I want to say that my work is hospital based mainly and often the, the group of people we see are patients who are relatively well a lot of our advanced patients are out in the community and, uh, and, and wouldn't be seen um, on a regular basis by ourselves. So the case I'm going to take you through is one of uh, more early onset, something that I'm sure you've all come across. Um, so this is just a sort of a normal case, a normal uh, type of presentation you might come across, a 57 year old lady who was diagnosed in 2016 with relapse and remitting MS, um, has been on uh, S1P uh, modulator since um, 2016 and has been very stable on it, uh, tolerating it well. And there's been no radi radiological changes since, uh, since she's been established on treatment. So at this clinic appointment, she'd come in and she'd been, she'd spoken about just that she had felt that her speech had changed in recent months. So as part of a standard assessment, we, we, we go through from sort of head to toe. So asking people, I think perhaps not everybody does it, but it's actually, it's important, I think, to ask people at their clinic appointment, you know, are you having any problems with your speech or swallow? Because while they might sound clear to us, it's, they themselves can can see those small idiosyncrasies. Um, so perhaps um, you know it could be something like um, control of volume or the pitch has changed. They might be sounding uh, nasally. It could be anything like this. But in this woman's case, um, she she her voice had been slurred, and in fact, it had been said to she had been asked um, on two occasions was she drunk at a time when she obviously wasn't um again as mentioned her voice was quieter she couldn't phonate properly and this really overall was causing a lot of frustration for her as trying to understand what was causing it and an embarrassment that people thought that she was maybe drunk at 11 o'clock in the morning um so this is how she came to us so i think as nurses you know it's really a 
important to sort of probe further to find out, you know, what might be causing it and what exactly is the problem she's having because um, how she perceives it might not be actually, might not relate to the actual cause. So it's really looking to see, is there any different, was it articulation, is it difficulty in, in speech and actually forming the words? Um, is there any, uh, you know, on, on, on clinical exam, is there any uh, issues with the cranial nerves, in particular, you know, 9, 10 and 12? Is there any deviation of the tongue, any um, relaxing or relaxing of the palate? Um, all of these things should be assessed just to see that we're actually aiming in on the actual problem. Um, then just finding out about the swallow. Is it at certain times? Is it after certain types of food or fluid? Um, again, has there been any weight loss? Is there coughing? Uh, or, or could it be, you know, has there been any recent chest infections? So all these things are important to consider when we're trying to actually uh, get to the root of the problem. So uh, I'm sure with many services, as with their own, why referral to speech and language is absolutely fantastic and is really important early so that the therapist can build up a good relationship, you know, before any maybe long term difficulties, uh, you know, become established. Um, I think, to be fair, it, it's very difficult and there's often long waiting lists for referral. So it's from a nursing point, what can we do? Is there anywhere we can signpost them? How can we support these people in that interim place? Um, because as David mentioned before, you know, it can be made worse with cognition, or, you know, with cognitive problems, or if there's issues around fatigue. So even addressing some of these things can help alleviate it. Um, and I guess, uh, when swallow when swallowing problems are directly related to MS or, or, or MS plaques, there re it really is looking at compensatory techniques as opposed to rehabilitation because they're never we're never really going to be able. I mean, I guess if the nerve damage is permanent or something like you know there, we're not going to be able to rehabit re rehabilitate that, and it is about looking at um, things around that. Um, so refer, as I said, for speech and language early. Um, and again, more so if it is dysarthria, uh, if it is dysarthria, so like basically swallowing difficulties, I think, you know, it is looking at that compensation piece earlier. Um, or well, sorry, if it is dys dysphagia, you've swallowing difficulties, or if it's a dysarthria, which is like trouble speaking, uh, weakness of the muscles, it's important to look at this compensation piece earlier. So it could be something like um, practicing or demonstrating the patient and reducing the speed of their voice. Often if they're speaking too fast or trying to get the words out in a tumble, it can come across more slurred. So it's really about pacing. Um, it's recommended that tapping, so uh, describing um, a tapping technique to the patient, so they tap the words out and they will go much slower. Um, I guess with the phonating difficulty, if it, if it is that the volume is just very low, you know, you might consider is some sort of amplification system required. Um, and I guess if you might need to do a scope of vocal cords if there is, you know, some if it's if if it's a maladaptive behaviour that's ongoing. Um, also, uh, just just to mention there, um, I guess uh, you know it's looking at the whole holistic care, and also we have to consider about tailoring treatment to patients, which which can be difficult, and obviously lack of resources, long waits, lack of access. So what are, you know, what do we need to do going forward? And actually it'd be worth linking in with your local speech and language therapist and maybe looking to acquire some basic skills uh, that you could then impart on the patient and their family that might help them in the, in the meantime. I guess you have to consider if there's functional stress, if there could be a functional element, if there's stressors related or, or, or other things like this. So again, signposting to local support systems, um, and I'm sure in the UK, I'm 
I, I've no doubt that there is a BMS Trust would have, you know, good signposting for this. Um, but I think if we can get the, if we can start off with some basic skills that we can impart to the patient, and then also, um, I, I guess, allow the patient to take away with them. So it just covers them from maybe that six month period while waiting. I think also what's important is to um, discuss with the speech and th language therapist when it's appropriate to make that referral because often, you know, we could be looking down the, we, we could be looking down the, the, the wrong pathway or leaving it too late or not on time. So um, I think that's it. Okay. Any questions, welcome. <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks so much, Sinead. And uh, that, that, that was a really interesting case. And I think challenges uh, many of us um, in, in our practice. Um, I, I've got some questions, ladies and gentlemen, please put things up on the Q&A uh, as they come up or, or any comments that you may have. Um, Tom, Tom Wilkinson has, has asked a really good question that I think really challenges how, how we speak about speech and um, uh, Sinead and Sheridan, you're really welcome to, to, to try and help me answer this. But Tom says, can I check when we say speech, are we referring to communication, i.e. including speech and language impairment in multiple sclerosis? Uh, Sinead, I'm sure this is asked a lot of speech and language therapists. What, uh, what, 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 would, you, what would you say to Tom's question? Me? Uh, please. Oh, yeah. Sheridan. <laughs> I thought Sheridan might be best at place to answer this. Uh, would you like to go, Sheridan? Yeah, sure. So <laughs> I'm Sheridan. Yeah. I'm hi everybody. I'm the speech and language therapist. Thank you, Sinead and David, and for the question. Um, definitely, I would say communication is kind of the umbrella term that we use. Um, it's more, I guess, a holistic way of looking um, at the different areas of communication rather than just you know speech or voice or any of the sort of sub. Um, areas. So yes, in answer to your question, communication, meaning speech, language, voice, any type of communication. Yeah. Um, yeah, Tom, maybe we should have made it a bit clearer in our in our title. Uh, <laughs> the shame we didn't think of that to think of that before. And, and Sheridan, I mean, presumably this is this is a uh, an issue people come to you and expect that you will be just helping with their speech, but, but <laughs> It's much more advanced than that, isn't it? It's so much extra that you can do. It is. I think part of the problem could just be in our name, speech and language therapists. I think that confuses people from the offset. Um, but yeah, we do swallowing and all sorts of things as well as just speech. Um, Sinead, I loved what you said about doing the early referrals. Um, I really think that's important, especially from a hospital setting so that you can, you know, try and, um, have that person cared for once they go back into the community because there is always a chance that the person may or may not um, advocate for themselves once they get back home from hospital to to do a referral via their GP so any communication you can have with your local service the hospital and the speech and language therapy community service um, uh, I think that would be an amazing sort of rapport to have with the two services yeah. Well, I mean, where where we are, and I know it obviously varies, but um, there is no outpatient speech and language therapy available mm -hmm. for outpatients. It's only an inpatient service due to, I guess, staff and the usual. Um, and so, actually, trying to get um, trying to get a referral to an appropriate person can be a six month wait if it's a, if it's on a public list. Mm -hmm. And actually, this can be really difficult. Um, and I guess the for me as a, as a nurse, obviously, it's like what what can we offer the patient in that interim point? It's like, is there? Uh, and I'd be interested to hear your suggestions. Into I've obviously spoken to my own speech and language therapist, uh, the one in, with us. But you know, is there anything that you would recommend that we could do during our our visit that we could sort of simple things that we could advise? Yeah, absolutely. I think you're very much on the right track with what you're already doing, which is really just listening to the person and trying to probe them with questions to find out if they're having swallowing, uh, sorry, speech and language difficulties, communication problems. 
and working out uh, what maybe their sort of life looks when they go back home to work out what their challenges are going to be, if it's work related or what have you, um, sending the referral through as soon as you can. So to avoid the long wait lists, of course. Um, And then hopefully um, as we move through the rest of the webinar today, I should be able to go through some more strategies in greater detail of things that you could do that would would not harm anybody, for example. They're just quite generic things that you could use um, and you could help the family and the patient and give them those tools so that if they do have a long wait to see a therapist, then they have something to go with. Um, and Sheridan, this uh, that sort of patient is someone who I perhaps wouldn't have previously thought of um, asking a speech and language therapist to review. Um, would is this the stage that we should be thinking about referral, given what Sinead said about trying to establish a rapport early and giving people compensatory strategies that they can use really early on in the in the in the journey with multiple sclerosis? Definitely. Always the earlier the referral, the better, because um, and I'll explain a little bit more as we go on. But there are some sort of um, therapies that sort of require early intervention as opposed to later. So um, if in doubt, I would say just send a referral. Oh, that's really that's really helpful. And and today made a really good point that actually, whilst we may have felt these symptoms when we talk to our patients are fairly subtle, they, they, they can have fairly significant impacts upon how people feel about themselves and their, 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 their interactions with others. Is that something you've come across as well, Sheridan? Yeah, definitely. So um, hopefully, again, I can just provide some more information as we move forward. <laughs> I don't want to repeat don't myself too much. much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We've got some more questions That's there. Shall I shall I move forward with um, the slides and and I think that will answer some of the questions here. Uh, Sheridan, many of those questions will be answered in your talk, so I think it might be worth going on to that. Uh, Angela's made a really good point um, that just to say the MS Trust does have some really good information professionals can look into in mm. this area. So thank thank you so much for that, Angela. Um, and yeah, the, the others, I, I hope, Sheridan, you will cover in part in your talk. So perhaps we'll get to that at the end of your talk. Thanks, everyone. Oh, sounds good. Thank uh, you. Sheridan, um, it's a pleasure to have you here. So Sheridan is a highly specialist speech and language therapist who works in Surrey Downs Health and Care. Uh, and Sheridan, I hope, is going to take us through some things that we could that we can offer to our patients uh, and some uh, learnings that she's got from her work in other neurological conditions. Thank, thank you so much, Sheridan. Thank you. Um, okay, so yeah, my name's Sheridan and um, I work in, uh, I've worked in acute and community and community hospitals. Um, and I will just give you sort of an introduction of what we do first, just so you know um, the basic outline of what we would do as speech and language therapists. So we'll assess um, the breakdown in the speech process and the impact on communication and lifestyle. And we also sort of try and keep in mind the cognitive factors that are affecting communication. Um, We can provide a maintenance therapy plan, um, personal and environmental speech strategies, and access to augmentative alternative communication aids. So um, the speech characteristics of individuals with multiple sclerosis um, typically look um, mostly towards prosody and articulation. So there's three areas of this, um, articulatory inaccuracy, prosodic excess, and phonatory prosodic insufficiency. So I'll just quickly give you some examples of those just so you are aware of what you're listening for. Um, Articulatory inaccuracy can be sort of imprecise consonants um, or distorted vowels. So maybe someone's saying a slightly different vowel sound than what you would expect. Um, Prosodic excess is where there might be prolonged speech sounds. So they're holding on to a sound for a lot longer or there's prolonged intervals in between words or slow or disjointed rate. Um, Then the phonatory prosodic, uh, prosodic insufficiency 
is more thinking about um, pitch. So it could be that the pitch stays very much the same note, or it could be that the person can't um, have loud and soft volume, or it could be that their voice can sound quite strained or strangled or harsh. So they're all things that you would sort of be listening for um, if you were trying to sort of see if somebody has a problem with their speech or communication. So let's look at some therapy and compensatory approaches. As Sinead mentioned, compensatory strategies are probably um, more what we go with just because of the nature of multiple sclerosis and, and how it does progress. Um, however, in saying that, we do try and do some sort of traditional therapy as well. So we first sort of start working with breathing, breath support and relaxation. And this is sort of to reduce stress and that sort of thing as well. Um, and we use that with exercises. And then there's EMST. Um, there's lots of new evidence coming out for EMST, which um, was first introduced within the Parkinson's population. And there's a lot of evidence for its success in that group of people. But we have started a speech and language therapist using it and we're getting lots of good results from different populations, not just Parkinson's. So that's exciting. Um, we look at the voice, so pitch and volume. Um, so we, we might give them some basic vocal hygiene advice, and this might be something that you like, might like to do um, in the hospital when you first meet a patient. You could ask them about how much water they're getting, staying hydrated, um, trying not to use their voice when they're tired, just simple sort of, it sounds like very logical things, but sometimes people just do need a bit of a reminder for those those things because they have so much going on that they might not realize why they're having a problem with their voice. Um, so, and with referring to us, you know, we might get someone who has a, a voice issue that isn't really to do with their multiple scler sclerosis diagnosis. So then we would refer them on to ENT or a um, voice specialist to, um, you know, treat that problem if there was an additional problem or an underlying pathology there with their voice. Um, we look at dysarthria, as Sinead mentioned. So we might do some oromotor exercises, although when we're doing these, we're sort of um, weighing up the effectiveness of these types of exercises against fatigue. So we don't want to cause unnecessary fatigue um, by trying to do rehab style um, exercises and we will work on prosody so that's the pacing again that Sinead was talking about it's excellent pacing boards or tapping out syllables can really help someone to stop cluttering their words or their sentences quickly go through the compensatory strategy so these are ones that you could just have like a sheet that you give to someone um, that says to you know these are the strategies you can use to help make your speech more intelligible so that's slowing your rate um, maybe using single words rather than full sentences, um, emphasizing keywords. And then there's other environmental things like making sure that there's, you know, the television's off in the background or um, using a different word, rephrasing a sentence, perhaps using gesture or facial expression. Um, if the person can write, then that's amazing. You can ask them to write if they're not able to verbalize what they need. And then AAC, which I'll go on to in a minute. Um, we also do work with partners um, to support the patient. So sometimes we find that um, there are a few just simple things that we can ask the partners to do. One of them could be, you know, facing the person that um, is speaking so that they can try and lip read what they're trying to say rather than just listening. And also checking that. Um, the partners, you know, if they if they need hearing aids, that they're wearing them. That's a common problem that someone has a speech problem and their partner has a hearing problem. And the combination of the two is just exacerbating everything. So, yeah, checking those sorts of things are good. Um, and other things that maybe especially for nurses might like to look at is um, checking medications. Some medications can cause a dry mouth, which can affect speech and does affect speech when you're nervous as well. <laughs> um, looking at hearing again, checking that they can hear and also just looking at cognition 
and keeping cognition in mind. So I'll just go quickly through AAC. Um, apologies if people already know what this is, but I just wanted to um, make sure that for people that don't, they know the difference between the two types of thing. So it's Augmentative Alternative Communication. That's why we have an acronym for it, because it's very long. And there are two broad categories, high tech and low tech. Um, so low tech may include something like a communication board or a book. Um, you can see that nurse is holding up like a few letters of the alphabet, maybe yes or no, something quite simple that's easy to access, that's sort of like a physical thing that they hold in their hand. And then we have high tech, which includes the use of technology, like an iPad, computer, smartphone. Um, I guess at this point, if you're thinking about referring to someone to speech and language therapy, maybe having a think about what type of um, technology they might be able to use. So some people won't um, naturally like to use an iPad or a phone. They're used to either writing or using their speech, and they're probably not going to be motivated to access that in the future. So it's important to think about whether it's appropriate for someone to be referred to, you know, have a iPad assessment if they're not really going to use it. Um, just something to think about. And of course, we never say never, but you do have some patients who just say, you know, hands down, they're not going to use an iPad or a computer. Um, we can do voice banking, and I thought I'd just touch on this really quickly. Um, it's mostly used with um, MND patients, so motor neuron disease. However, um, we do use it a little bit with MS. Um, I guess the complicated thing with MS is that it's the um, sort of we're not sure what the prognosis is going to be, especially in terms of um, their visual ability and their ability to use their hands. So voice banking allows a person to record phrases with their own voice. And then we, we sort of record the voice as it is, and we can upload it into an application. And typically the person might use it on their iPad and they might use their fingers to move through to talk, or they might use a switch. They might use eye gaze to control it. But again, this is why it's, it's probably not being used as much with, um, the MS population because um, a lot of people who have MS also have difficulties with their vision. So if they're not able to talk and they're not able to use their hands, then you know if their vision is also gone, it's probably not going to be an appropriate um, pathway for them. So um, having a look at whether AAC will work for everyone, we're just going to think about whether they are going to know that they might lose their voice, looking at whether it's really severe or mild or moderate dysarthria. Um, if it's mild or moderate, you can um, also do something called voice repair where they kind of add a synthetic voice with, with your own voice and produce something that a lot of people find um, you know, sonic, more sonically pleasing. A lot of patients think, oh, wow, it's restored my voice to what it used to be. And this is another important sort of thing with the early intervention. It, you do want to get someone very early on in the stage to do voice banking. Uh, message banking is just simply recording audio on their phone or on any device. It can be things like them saying, I love you, them laughing, saying their partner's name. They're all things that you could do with your patient um, early on. Like if they were, if they wanted to do it, you could do it on their phone. So they will always have that there if they wanted to use it at a later point in time. Okay, I'll just really quickly go through this because this is a little bit more um, advanced, I guess, in a way. So it's just to do with assistive technology. And I, the, the reason why I want to talk about it a little bit is just so that you can picture in your head what services might be able to be utilised if they went back into the communi community and what they do. So these domains of function um, are enhanced with assistive technology. And the first one is the motor access. So this is the sort of thing that I was talking about where the progressive muscle impairments associated with MS most commonly like weakness, spasticity, ataxia, um, they affect gross and fine motor skills. 
So there are plenty of modifications that we can sort of circumvent these difficulties. Um, there's things like using word prediction rather than typing in a whole word, switches placed near the person's face or, or buttons. We can, you know, look at different keyboards and all that sort of thing. There's, there's so many different things that we can try to um, help someone to be able to access um, using their speech device, so using their iPad. Um, visual enhancement. So again, we might look at how the optic neuritis can interfere with reading small text, depth perception, object identification, and shifting gaze. So this is important with communication because the person might be using their iPad or their phone to communicate. We want to make sure that we're um, sort of compensating for these visual deficits. So we might enlarge or bold text computer, tablet screens. We might try different high contrast color palettes depending on what the person needs. Um, On-screen magnifiers. And then finally, the sensory integration. So um, these include sort of loss or abnormal sense of touch, impaired prior, pro prior perception, um, inconsistent body temperature and reduced hearing. So some compensatory examples to um, address these sensory impairments are like putting alarms on wheelchairs, um, modifying the surface of buttons or putting like brightly colored tape so that the person can see. So this is kind of, it's a bit of a gray area because it's it might sound a bit more like I'm moving into environmental things and I, I am a little bit, but I just wanted to touch on that because as speech and language therapists we do work with those services to set up the speech and communication device with this sort of environmental enhancements so that the person can access their iPad or their speech generate generating device. Okay so this is a case study of a lovely young lady who I saw in late um, 2020. Um, you can see here Ruth has very kindly summarised her sort of journey, 2018, her fatigue, cognitive impairment and ataxia, all of the issues that she's having. And these are the things that we're looking at, you know, how is how are her speech and fatigue and impairments, you know, impacting her daily life? Um, Ruth noticed that she was having all of these kinds of issues in terms of her emotions, her cognition, memory speech, movement. So she very quickly did refer her on to our team. We have a multidisciplinary team, which is wonderful. Um, and then because Ruth had mentioned that there was speech and memory issues, we did a block of therapy concentrating on utilizing the compensatory strategies that I was telling you about. So slowing down emphasis, articulation, and I used sort of um, a memory technique, like a memory building technique to practice those um, strategies with, if that makes sense. So the, um, the memory task was called MSMT and it stands for Modified Story Memory Technique. It's a memory exercise which engages multiple regions of the brain. Uh, it was studied in people with diagnosis of MS or traumatic brain injury, and the Kessler Foundation research showed a significant improvement in memory of daily life. So I'm just using this to sort of, um, you know, have a holistic approach with this with this young woman because she was struggling with her memory and also struggling with her speech. So this was sort of a nice thing where we could encompass and and make some goals that were not just speech related, but also helping her with her memory and her daily activities. So um, she did report a, a real improvement in her memory and her quality of life, which was wonderful. Um, we looked at assistive technology. Um, she specifically used speech to text. So she was having difficulty typing, um, especially with her right hand. So there are some really great apps now that even if you have a little bit of a speech difficulty, the app is quite good at knowing what you're trying to say. So she used that a lot to do her to do her schoolwork. Um, she's a teacher. And um, she found that really, really helpful rather than tiring herself out trying to type all of her work. Um, we also set up a microphone for her. She was doing a lot of online work. 
and we adjusted the levels so that she wasn't overusing her voice. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that we did was some sort of breathing exercises and some oromotor exercises. So those sort of traditional um, rehabilitation exercises, but just keeping in mind her fatigue, not pushing those really, just sort of using them to keep the muscle movement happening. Um, and then some general vocal hygiene. So that uh, when I say vocal hygiene, I mean um, just reminding her um, to drink a lot of water, to be aware of when she might be tired, looking at times of her day, her schedule, where she's more tired or her voice is more tired and trying to schedule in her voice um, or her teaching lessons at a time where she's feeling really good and, and that her voice is really good. And then, you know, as the day goes on, if she's becoming more fatigued, she can um, just have a rest then, a vocal rest, and then wake up new day next day and, and start again. So yeah, she, she made improvements in all areas of her breath control and articulation. So we met all of the goals. Um, she was able to utilize the skills that we learned with the MSMT, so the memory technique, and she generalized those into her daily life and was able to use those skills in her daily life to improve her memory. So all in all, it was a really positive experience with her. Um, and I do hope to see her again. I know she's still part of the team. As you can see, um, she did ask to be transferred back to our team. So I'm sure if we need to see her again, we will he hear from her. Um, thanks for listening. See if there are any questions. Uh, yeah, no, thanks. Thanks so much, Sheridan. Uh, what, what, what a comprehensive overview and what a, uh, an inspiring case study to, uh, to really get us going. Uh, there's loads of questions already, but uh, ladies and gentlemen, keep them coming through. Um, uh, I'll, I'll make a start uh, at the top. So, um, uh, Sheridan and Sinead, you, you, you I'm sure you both have thoughts about this, but uh, Kathy Semple has asked, if, if you have a patient who has word finding difficulties, what, what advice would you give them and, and how, how might you be able to help those sort of patients? Um, Sh Sheridan, do you, do you want to make a start? Uh, sure. Um, advice for Kathy? Again, I would probably um, try and really keep in mind fatigue and cognition and, and how that might be impacting the person's word finding difficulties. So, it can almost sort of skew results when you're talking about language and whether someone can't think of the word to say. If someone is, you know, not able to concentrate or having some memory issues due to fatigue, that's going to be the, 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 the goal will be to manage the fatigue and to manage those problems rather than looking at um, word finding therapy per se. Um, however, in saying that, you can still do... Um, there's, you know, word finding exercises that we sometimes use. They're typically used for patients who have aphasia, so stroke patients or what have you. But we do we do sort of transfer that over to the MS population if needed. If they're really struggling just finding words, we will do that type of therapy with them as well. Um, what, think, what does that therapy look like, Sherrod? Is that, is that yeah, so it, it might be... Um, sort of semantic relations of words, identifying um, words using, say, phrases, like I might say black end, and the person will have to say white, boy, and girl. If, it, if it's a real problem with word finding, we might start with something like that. Um, and then just, just getting the person to use their mind, either using pictures, semantic relations, or any other sort of tools to get them to be thinking about words in a different way and to sort of activate different areas of the brain if possible yeah to find out where those words are hiding <laughs> uh, and Sinead sorry I interrupted you no 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 that sorry that was a much better question <laughs> um you know I think uh actually just often with the word finding it, it from my experience in those particularly earlier stage it tends to be more around cognition and fatigue, you know, uh, and I think addressing those and how to avoid boom and bust and, and taking your time, you know, and actually maybe deciding what needs to actually be done in the house today and, and, and you know, what can be put off uh, and delegating. I think all of those things are important. 
um, in terms of just trying to deal with that fatigue element first um, uh, and then try, uh, uh, as Sheridan said, work on the uh, on maybe, you know, keeping the synapses moving and the brain working. Um, but actually, I really loved her idea of the sort of cheat sheet, you know, the therapy and compensatory approaches. I mean, I think even to have a template or a framework like that would be really useful um, for people uh, to use in a clinical setting that we can just give those tips to people or hand it out in some sort of pamphlet. Yeah, it's incredible, isn't it? All, all those simple things that, that we can. Yeah, that, that it's life changing. We can do. Um, Rachel Wilson's got a point and uh, it really follows on Tom's points, um, but that actually um, that, that this also impacts upon cognition. Um, and do, do you have any advice for assessment strategies and support with this? And Sher Sheridan, you've given us a few suggestions uh, as to things that we can use. But I suppose it comes back to Tom's point, isn't it, that, that you can't consider speech uh, without thinking about communication. You can't think about communication without thinking about the way that you think and cognition. Um, but yeah, well, uh, do, do, do you have any extra thoughts that you'd like to, to, to present about that? Oh, I think probably looking at the communication when the person is feeling good and making a comparison about that and whether the communication issues uh you know sort of across the board so even when the person is having a good day they're still having these problems that's kind of where I would look at starting because I think you know there's not really any amount of therapy that we can do that's going to fix someone's problem if they're fatigued um or having memory issues but yeah working on memory um, occupational therapists also do a lot of memory and cognition work so referring to them is really helpful as well and Sheridan, I uh, was struck by in your case that, uh, despite being a speech and language therapist, that you actually worked on your patient's memory as well to improve them using the modified story memory technique. W is that a standard thing that you do, or did you tailor it particularly to the needs it, of that patient? It was interesting. She, I guess why I wanted to present her is because she was very highly motivated, you know, very young, wanting to... Um, you know, she had specific things that she really wanted to overcome in her daily life that were holding her back. And so, yeah, I think memory is probably more of an occupational therapy thing, but I did find that specific technique where she had to sort of describe things. So we were using, we were just combining two things basically and using that as therapy, which was kind of fun. <laughs> and uh, did you find it easy to do is it, is it is it an easy technique to learn um it's pretty it's it's pretty easy I'm just going to quickly get up the slide so basically it it's sort of you're creating a new memory so she would have to think of a new memory um and it, it looks at three parts so encoding consolidation and then retrieving it um and then she was sort of having to use imagery and context so using a familiar place or walking down the street that sort of thing to really help her to engage. And then what she would do is to remember or place things along the street that she would need to remember during the day. And then she would articulate that to me and use the compensatory strategies, like slow rate and that kind of thing to describe to me what she was, what she was doing with her sort of memory um, exercise. And yeah, she found it beneficial. She said that it did help her to remember things during the day without writing a list. So that's fun. Yeah, and it's, it's a very elegant way to help her with two of her problems, doesn't it, with the memory and with the, the, the speech. The speech. Yeah. Sh Sinead, do, do, do you have other things that you help, uh, that you use for your patients with multiple sclerosis? Uh, well, we're, actually, we're actually really um, lucky to have access to a neuropsychologist who sits in on our clinic. So actually we can get that sort of cognition uh, a brief assessment at that point so it can give us some sort of benchmark I guess in terms of if it is more cognitive I think actually what just crossed my mind there and I, I, in relation to one of the questions I see also is I think it's important and uh, what has certainly come up um, and I know it's a hot topic at the moment but I think it's particularly for middle-aged women it's important to consider other things like menopause and hormones because actually there's a huge 
a crossover of symptoms being word finding, uh, brain fog, yes. you know, speech <laughs> difficulties, feeling like you absolutely can't keep up with your job. And I think this is really important. And we are can be sometimes overcomplicate things. And it's really about the unpicking, getting down to the actual, you know, differentials that could be the cause I mean while obviously MS is a huge factor and that's what we're here to talk about today I think it's important to remember that sometimes we've been so focused on the condition we work with we fail to forget that there are other influences that could be impacting this absolutely thank you for saying that Sinead that's something yeah. that we've been talking about in the team recently and looking into and it, it does because let's say someone's having you know word finding issues because of that reason and then that yeah. you know there is not really any amount of speech and language therapy that's no. going to help so it's really <laughs> <laughs> it is really a good thing to try and figure out the cause of why yeah. someone might yeah. be having speech or, or word finding difficulties yeah and potentially a much easier fix you know exactly yeah <laughs> yeah uh, Sheridan the next question is do, do, do you mind explaining to anyone who's not familiar what EMST is I, I must admit I googled it as um, you spoke and it looks incredible yes <laughs> so it's expiratory muscle strength training so basically you use a device um and you have to sort of you you need to have a speech and language or a trained speech and language therapist to um, explain to you how to use the device and um, you you sort of have this intensive therapy for you know a few weeks using the device and it helps um, to build up your breath support and breath control um, it, I know we're not talking about swallowing today but um, it definitely helps um, one of the benefits is that it, it does help produce a stronger cough so if you're having swallowing difficulties and things are going down the wrong way, it's been shown to improve that. So that's, um, yeah, there's a lot of new evidence coming out about that. So yeah, expiratory muscle strength training. Questions keep coming in. So Tom Wilkinson uh, makes a really good point, which uh, I think Sinead really goes to the heart of your case that um, Tom's found that a few of his MS patients with mild wording fighting difficulties the difficulties are far more significant to the patient, barely noticeable um, on assessment. Um, uh, he says, in these cases, there has to be some acceptance that this is MS related. They can use strategies, um, but uh, some of this is uh, to do with perhaps some, a degree of acceptance. And this is harder when people have high flying jobs and it has yeah. an impact on their daily life and, and people are being judged by their fluency and speed of recall uh, and it's often how we judge how clever people are how, how well they how well they speak yeah I mean I I certainly um I met a, a patient and a guy who was like that in a really uh, big job and he was saying that he just didn't feel as sharp now to me he was completely articulate absolutely clever guy no problem so I would no way would have noticed it but he was noticing just that he wasn't as quick maybe wasn't as able to organize himself better I think these are the tricky people to manage because they're living up their their bar is set so high in terms of where they're meant to be and then trying to actually um I'm not sure Sheridan if, if there is sort of recommendations you can give to these guys maybe um I don't know. We Sudoku. would do some sort of, um, you know, in a case like that, maybe we would do an exercise where I maybe I can see something that that person is doing, whether they're, you know, hosting a webinar or whatever they're doing, that I can give them sort of this feedback and it be part of the therapy to um, gain confidence, I guess, in areas where they do have great skills and just really hone in on the, the the things that they feel are holding them back or that have changed since their diagnosis. Yeah. And Simia makes a really good additional point. And one of the things I really liked about your talk, uh, both Sinead and Sheridan, is that part of the responsibility of this is actually on the person listening. Uh, communication is a two-way process and you have to speak, but someone has to listen. Um, and a big part of supporting people with multiple sclerosis is managing expectations of their family and friends and carers who are involved with them. And actually, I, I liked both your presentations, how you engaged uh, those people in the, the, the care of those people. 
Yeah, I mean, I can't I can't say for, um, you know, every area, but, you know, in some areas there are services where you can attend um, speech therapy groups as a couple as well. That can be really helpful, but you would just have to look in your area and see if if anything like that's provided. But, yeah, they're really, really helpful. People really, you know, feedback that they love it. So worth worth finding out if you have anything like that in your area. Absolutely. And just just asking people to, you know, get the hearing aids done, look at the person when they're speaking to them, make it, you know, make life as easy as possible for the person who's trying to speak. Um, Alex Jameson uh, Sheridan has just asked us, uh, where, where can you get training on EMST from? Oh, I'm not actually sure because I'm not trained in it. I have my colleague um, has been trained. I'm not sure exactly where you would do that, but I could. Sorry that I don't have an answer for that. Oh, it's all right, Alex. Uh, I think we'll, <laughs> we, we might have to get back to you. Uh, two, two last questions. Ruth has asked that um, that, that she has noticed. Ruth Strauss has noticed that people sometimes have relapses and they get physical changes that are really apparent, and then they get better. Um, Sher Sheridan, Sinead, have you seen similar things in speech symptoms where people have a relapse affecting the speech, which then improves? Yeah, no, for sure. I think it's like, um, even not necessarily relapse, actually, where we see a lot with stuff like this is even in pseudo relapse, you know, where infection is present, uh, you know, that's been untreated or left, you know, a while, that it can come across in just if they have this sort of dysartery already you know if it's maybe there it can be enhanced or worsened uh you know probably more so I definitely think it was probably reported slightly more when people had COVID as well I think there might have been a crossover in that um but yeah I think like that it will from the re from the relapse side usually all of these things resolve once when once, once either the relapse or the infection is 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 treated you know so it sort of goes back to baseline which is good uh, yeah, and... yeah, I agree. I think there are um, re more reported speech difficulties during the relapsing phases of MS, so, sort of suggesting, you know, maybe cor correlated to um, speech disorder. And I guess if you're thinking about it in terms of like progressive changes in movement, sensation and cognition, then that's probably going to affect those muscles as well if it's affecting other areas of the body. Um, we see it in swallowing as well. If someone's decompensated with with an infection, their swallowing and their speech dips more often than not when that's happening. Great. Um, well, uh, Sinead and Sheridan, the, the the hour has just flown by. I don't really know where the uh, where the time where the time has gone. Um, but look, thank you so much, um, uh, Sinead and Sheridan, for your support of this. Uh, and ladies and gentlemen at home, thank you so much for all your interaction. Uh, you've made some really good points uh, and I've learned a huge amount both uh, from uh, Sinead and Sheridan and from our interactions at the end. Um, uh, my, my standout feeling from this webinar is that this is a huge problem that uh, yeah. to date we haven't really been talking about in people with multiple sclerosis that the, 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 you know the two largest papers uh, in the impact of this like you said eight, very little evidence no, 80, yeah. there's 80 <laughs> people in those two papers and there's one person yeah. one author who's done it from mm. a, a a random sample of people who responded to a flyer in buffalo so that there's huge opportunities in our community to try and characterize this better uh, thankfully, uh, Sinead and Sheridan have gone ahead of the evidence and are already using their clinical experience to really support people with multiple sclerosis. Um, Sinead, I was particularly impressed in your talk about how important it was to identify these things at an early stage. And yeah. uh, many members of the community have mentioned that, that these are incredibly socially disabling symptoms that, that, that we can help at an early stage and Sheridan it was really nice hearing from you that it, it is worth picking these things up early and arranging an early referral to speech and language therapy and there are things that we're able to do at that stages and it's important to make uh, that early connection there's things that we can do as clinicians and um, some pretty simple things like giving people advice upon pacing and I liked your idea of speech hygiene um, looking at the medications that we give people helping people involve their partners, um, 
uh, and helping people to work on their articulation. I'm sure there's things that we can probably work on as a community, providing people with more um, specialised advice. Uh, and it's going to be really important that we uh, engage and continue to engage with uh, speech and language therapists. And some of the techniques that you described for people with more advanced speech disturbances are absolutely incredible. And I've seen them be transformative in people with motor neuron disease, but I hadn't really thought about the use in multiple sclerosis. Um, uh, just a few last points from me. Uh, the uh, MS Academy people have let us know that we're going to answer, the, Alex, your question about ESMT training uh, on the web page when we've finished recording and uh, we've all looked it up. Uh, and if this has tempted your interest for uh, these sorts of things, then our next webinar is on the 17th of April. Uh, and it sort of goes on a theme, so we're going to be looking at swallow and respiratory involvement in people with MS. Um, uh, Sinead, Sheridan, any, any last points or anything else that, that, that I haven't covered? Uh, no, I yeah. You go, Sinead. <laughs> I was going to say no, not at all. I think, I think we've covered most of it in that there probably is not a whole lot that we can do, but we can just try our best to be there with the patient. And um, thanks for having me today. Yes, thank you for having me. Absolute pleasure. And ladies and gentlemen at home, thanks for logging in on your Friday before your holiday. Uh, please give us any feedback that you'd like and please log in for the next one on the 17th of April. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye. Bye.